welcome guys. Okay, so I did little, put a little bit of a disclaimer here. This is not a very technical session. It's a very basic thing. I will probably make an admission. I'm the worst developer at this conference because I am not a developer. I am actually a data person. So SQL, DAX, those kind of languages I'm more than comfortable with. Python, Linux has been, Linux has been my biggest challenge. Okay, but uh, yeah, so, so this is more my trials and tribulations of how I got into it and then like what I went on to do. Okay, so uh, my name is Michael Johnson. I'm a Microsoft Data Platform MVP, as I said, so that's, I like data stuff. Um, I didn't really include any data portions in this portion. You want me to stand there. You have a big problem. Ask this man. I, I'm what they call a prowler. I sort of just walk off up and down the screen. Okay, so uh, yeah, so um, uh, I said we just were going to look at how I sort of got into garden automation. Again, not IoT. I just wanted to start playing with that lower level stuff. Okay. So my journey, I started off where I, what I promised you today is a sprinkler automation system, right? So I've got, uh, I've got a little garden, and I try to grow. Well, my hobby is probably grow, growing plants where they shouldn't be grown, right? So nothing's really in the ground. I mean, there is stuff in the ground, but not a lot of it. But a lot of pots, and you'll see I, I start growing other places, but I, I like growing things in jars and you know, all those sort of crazy places. And if you are a garden and you grow things in pots, you'll know that the pot dries out very quickly, right? It's not like soil that holds it. You actually need to, to water it, uh, not too much, but it tends to be very regular. The soil holds its thing, pot. Um, so yeah, we'll discuss some of those challenges. Uh, then after I did this, because it's, th this is like the gateway drug, right? So you, you did the first one and then you got into the next one. So then I built a little aquaponics system, okay? So I'll discuss how I did that and, and, and what went wrong with it. Because there's often more things that went wrong than actually went right. Uh, so those, those are the things. And then I grew what I, I'm calling it the mushroom box. I don't, I, I don't have a really cool name for it just yet. But uh, I, I, I built a little mushroom thing as well. All right. So uh, let's start off with the irrigation system. When I moved into my house many, many years ago, it came with something that looked like this. It, this isn't my one, but it's, it's that kind of thing. So I could set the time in it, and then I could set a schedule. So I said, hey, water every day, every other day, or every, uh, you know, twice a day, right? And then you could do it for three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, and you had to choose from this point, which isn't very uh, practical in all cases, right? So uh, we're meant to be in a water-wise world, you know, uh, in, you know, at Joburg, you know, it rains at about 6 o'clock, which is exactly when I, so it's very often that my sprinkler system turns on in the middle of a thunderstorm. Um, now, it's not a lot of water. I'm probably not killing the planet, but it does seem a little bit uh, weird. So anyway, so what were the problems, right? Uh, the first is I water the soil, or, or this thing ends up watering even when things are moist. Now, why could it be moist? Maybe it was overcast that day. The pots haven't dried out. Maybe it actually rained. Uh, you know, whatever happened, okay? My son loves going into the garden and, and just sort of drenching the entire thing. That, that's his thing. Uh, so my garden is absolutely saturated. Uh, but yeah, um, then, uh, you know, am I going to water the garden if I know it's about to rain? Okay, so this is a bit of a cost-conscious kind of thing. Again, not, not, not really a, too much of a problem. And then because I'm lazy, I was chatting to you, uh, no, one of your colleagues about, I'm a lazy gardener. I'm actually not a gardener, right? I just like, you know, <laughs> I like plants, but I don't like gardening. My garden's a mess, all right? Um, but, uh, you know, this thing goes flat because I don't go out there all that often, all right? So this little battery lasts about three months, which is long enough to make you forget about it. You don't think about it. And then you come out two weeks later and everything's dead because, as I say, pots dry out incredibly quickly. So those were my three challenges. Okay, so what was my workflow? Because like any good IT person, we should think about what we're going to build. So how am I going to execute this? You know, how am I going to start this thing? I'm happy with the simple timer system, okay, because I don't need any sort of real-time thing. I don't want my sprinkler system going off while I'm out having a braai with the, with the family, right? So I'm happy with the six o'clock, although that is usually braai time, right? But uh, the first thing we want to do is determine if the soil is wet. You know, if it is, if it is wet, well, you know, just, just, you know, stop, right? Stop right there, okay? Next bit I want to then determine is, is it going to rain within the next 24 hours? Okay, because if it's gonna rain, maybe don't water the garden. And then finally, if that is the case, water the garden. Okay, so that's basic workflow. I don't think that's stumped anybody. Nothing in the session should stump anybody. Okay, um, so what did we need? 
Uh, so I started off with this guy, is a Raspberry Pi. How many of you have Raspberry Pis? How many of you started with getting that Raspberry Pi with the intention of actually experimenting? And you've probably all turned it into a media stream or an ad blocker, right? Because that is, that is all we end up doing with these things because nobody actually ever uses them. But uh, our Pies were designed for experimentation, right? They have more than just USB and network ports. Okay, so that's what these things look like. Uh, the first uh, ones actually came out with 28 uh, uh, pins. Modern ones have 40 pins. Now, you'll see the little red ones. That's essentially powered uh, ports, so you have two power uh, uh, two sort of power levels, if settings, if you will. There's 5 volts and 3.3, which is generally good enough for most things. I learned that 3.3 uh, still pops lots of LEDs. So I've got a little pile of burnt-out LEDs in my cupboard. Um, You've got the green ones, which are the ground, because, you know, electricity has to go somewhere. And then you've got a whole bunch of these GPIO pins, okay? And you'll see that the numbering doesn't make sense, okay? We'll get to that bit in a second. But you have all of these little pins that you can then interact with, so you can read or you can output off these things. Okay, so that's what a Pi does, and it allows us to uh, sort of interact with other devices. Okay, so what are some of the devices? The first thing I need to do is I actually need to be able to water the garden, right? Now, the Pi doesn't have a handy little hand that pops out of it and, and turns the tap, so I need a solenoid valve. And a solenoid essentially means, I don't know if you uh, guys, uh, look, if you're as old as me, you probably, uh, uh, it, it means that there's a magnet involved, right? So how does this work? Very simply, uh, I have a pipe coming in, and I have this handy, this little uh, 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 sort of stopper over here, and while this thing is in place, the water won't flow. Okay, and this is important because solenoids come in two flavors. There is a normally open and a normally closed. So normally closed means when there's no power, uh, power applied, it, the water won't flow, okay? Normally opens means it would flow until I stop it. If I had a normally open solenoid valve and ESCOM decided to load shed me for eight hours, what would happen to my garden? I would not be having a good time, right? Okay, so we want to start with a normally closed and essentially what happens is when I apply that current, it sort of lifts this little stopper, and the water flows through, right? And, and then you can set that on a timer, and then we can close it uh, uh, when we want. So that was the first component I need. Like any good experimenter, I decided to disassemble it, because what could go wrong? And these are essentially what it's made out of. So you've got this is the little mag magnetic rod that essentially gets lifted up and down. You have the spring that goes at the top that pours, forces that down. That's the plunger. This is, the, uh, this is the magnet, and then that is the valve, right? So really simple. If you have any questions about anything, go for it. Okay, um, so the, the first challenge I had is that the solenoid valve uses a 12-volt DC connection, okay? Now, I told you on the Pi, we had what? 3.3 and 5, so all of a sudden I had a problem. Now, I probably could use a step-up transformer, I'm not sure I know enough about electronics, but I do know, like any good IT person, I have a cupboard full of those things, okay? <laughs> so I decided to use that, okay? So just uh, sort of cut it off and uh, 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 used it. So that gives me the power, but how do I control this power? Exactly like my water, how do I turn this thing on and off? Okay, and we've got another solenoid, okay? And this thing's gonna work in something called a relay, and exactly like uh, the solenoid, we've got a little magnet and a switch, and when I apply that current, it, it closes the circuit and my thing. So you've seen this seems a little bit redundant. A lot of it is actually just being able to turn this thing on and off, right? And you're going to see how much space actually gets sent to power. I mean, just I'm not suggesting what I built is the most efficient. Okay, so we've got our little uh, 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 sort of relay. We kind of understand how it works. Unfortunately, I couldn't disassemble this one, it comes in as a pretty solid unit, you can kind of see, uh, but there's two important portions of it, right? So the first bit is these input pins. So we start off providing power to the system, okay? So we've got the ground, and then we take the power, it needs the five volt, so we plug it onto pins two and four. Remember, those were five, uh, our, our little five volt ones. And this just powers the relay, and then we've got a control. Now this is a uh, this is a four-channel relay, so it can actually control four, uh, four separate things. So you'll see that there's four different inputs, in one, in two, in three, and in four. Uh, I use, I mean, I'm pointing to in two, but I used in one. doesn't really matter. Okay, and then you've got the output side. So this is what each channel looks like. Uh, you've got the current coming in, 
okay? And then like, these, uh, like the solenoid valve we spoke earlier, where we've got that always, you know, default on, default off, the relay actually comes with both of those, okay? So if you wanted by default off, you would use the bottom one, okay? So this says as long as I'm not applying a signal, that's, that, that circuit will not be closed. But if I wanted it to be, always be on and, and, and turn that off, uh, I'm thinking maybe some sort of a security system, you know, where you push the button and the magnetic door, you know, so that kind of release, I guess you would use the, uh, you know, the off by default. Okay, so that kind of gives us that uh, uh, sort of uh, a relay, right? And then, so what was next is I start asking those questions, okay? So what is the soil moist? How do we detect it? There's, there's a couple of uh, items that you can actually use, uh, but th this is a, what they call a resistive soil probe. And very simply, that works. Do you guys remember science? Back when we had to do it, yeah, physics, I think they called it. Okay, so we've got a cathodonal anode. We're going to apply a current between those two. There's going to be some amount of resistance, okay? Uh, you probably remember that uh, water doesn't actually conduct electricity. It's actually the salt, and, but we get a little bit of moisture. And then we get, so it depends on how much moisture is in the system, uh, it actually determines the resistance. So that gives us a, a, an amount of resistance. But this is our first challenge is that the Raspberry Pi, those little GPIO opens, are digital. I cannot read a, you know, an analog number. I can't say 3.5 ohms, right? I need a one or a zero, or in this case, 3.5 volts or zero volts, right? So, so, so we need something that's able to uh, convert that analog signal to a number. Now, the other thing to remember about this number is the number doesn't actually mean too much, okay? Because uh, there isn't, this thing can't go in and say your, your soil uh, humidity is 72%, right? Because, you know, different soil types, different amounts of salts in the water, all of these things come into play, but it will give you a number between like a zero and one, right? Okay, so the next thing we need is a digital, or an analog to digital converter, and this converts that signal into that zero or one, right? Now, one thing to take note of is that little dial over there. Okay, so how does this thing work? simply takes the analog signal, we've got that little dial, and that, that determines the threshold. So this, this says, I put my, th my, my little item in the ground, and then I can actually determine when do I want this thing to flip over from a one to a zero, and then that's exactly what you will get. So what you, what you kind of do, it's a bit archaic, but you put it in the soil that you think is just right, or, or just about to go dry, right, if that's our measure. So the soil that I think is just about to go right, I turn that little screw until the little LED comes on. It's quite nice because there is a little LED over there that'll tell you, hey, am I, am I sensing this or not? So you don't even have to have it plugged into your Pi at that point to uh, uh, determine something. So yeah, so we've got that, and we've got this ability to determine whether our soil is too dry or not, and that was, that was my first challenge in my workflow. Okay, a simple example, I could take 6.8, right, and whatever, that turns into A1, you know, 0.3 might have given a zero, right? Okay, whatever that amount is, that's really up to you. Okay, now what about rain? Rain's a little bit harder. What I could have done is built something like that. So that's like a little weather station. Has anybody here heard, uh, heard the term shaving the yak? Now, I, I fall for that quite a lot, and really what shaving the yak says is when I need to build something, I start building it, and then I realize, actually, I need that other thing to build the thing. So then I start building that thing. And then, well, actually, I need that thing to build this thing so I can build that. Then I start on that thing. And do you know how many things you get done at the end of the day? None, right? Okay, so I, uh, I chickened out, or I, or I opted for a more elegant solution. My Raspberry Pi has Wi-Fi, okay? <laughs> so it has internet access, so I'm going to use the open weather service. And this allows me to make external calls to the system to determine some weather. The open weather API is cool because it's free, which is always a win. It allows you to make two million calls a month, which I'm going to get nowhere near. And uh, essentially, it works like this. Okay, so that's a little bit grainy, but essentially, you've got some sort of URL, like an endpoint, and then you're going to give it the latitude and longitude of where you are. So you say here, and then you, uh, and then you can ask, what is the weather going to look like? There's also a little API key uh, that, that you should put in. Okay, and that's going to give you a data set that looks like this. It's actually going to give you, this one is, this particular API is going to give you 48 uh, data points, right? One for each hour for the next two days. Now, what I 
my example is I, I, I only want to know for the next 24 hours, so I just read the first 24 nodes, all right? And you're going to see how badly I did that earlier. Don't judge my Python code. Uh, but yeah, so, so I'm using this, and what I'm looking for is that description of light rain. It can be light rain, rain, or heavy rain, right? Okay, I, I haven't seen thund thunderstorm. Maybe I should uh, uh, research that a little bit more uh, uh, thoroughly, but I haven't had a problem with that yet. Okay, so these are all the bits I needed, uh, and then I started putting this, uh, uh, you know, once I put all the hardware together, okay, I then needed some code, and I'm going to show you the code. This actually really isn't my code because it's really simple. Uh, I did know because now I'm a cool Linux developer. Black mode, dark mode is, is, is the only way to do things. So uh, we're going to use dark mode for the coding. Uh, first thing I want to do is trigger the file. Anybody here from the Linux world, how would I schedule something? Huh? Cron, cron jobs, exactly that, right? I'm a database person. Uh, apparently, there isn't a SQL Server agent for me to run. So I'm going to use this cron job. And what a cron job is pretty easy to do. You just say, hey, I want to go and edit my cron job. And then I'm going to go and schedule it. And this is what I used. So it comes with two, uh, two portions. It comes with the schedule definition, okay? And then it comes with the, the code that you want to execute. All right, so the code that you want to execute is really easy. I'm going to say, you know, Python 3, go and run that Python file. Easy, easy peasy. But these, these cron jobs are actually pretty psychedelic. Okay, so I'm going to create the world's worst cron job definition. You would never create one like this, but it'll cover everything, right? So when we say star, so the first segment is minutes. Next one is hours, then it's days, then it's months, and then it's day of week. Okay, so star divide, so if I said star, it would be every minute, right? Star divided by five, or, or, or uh, asterisk divided by five, depending on who you are. Uh, that means it's going to run every five minutes. Okay, but it's going to run every five minutes, f every sixth hour of the day. So between uh, midnight and 1 a.m., at 6 a.m. to 7 a.m., 12 to 1 p.m. So anyway, but then it's going to run in those... those those little batches, this is only going to happen on the 1st, 15th, and 29th of the day of the month, only for January, April, July, you know, whenever, and only if it's a Monday. Okay, so you can imagine this isn't going to run particularly trustly, but those are the sections, right? So now you know what cron jobs are. If anything, you learned that. Okay, so how do we control the relay? Thankfully, controlling the relays is actually really easy because you're going to use the very base uh, 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 sort of libraries for reading the pins. Let's go have a look at how those. First, we're going to go and import the library. I'm using Python here. Obviously, you can use C Sharp, but uh, Python and Raspberry Pis go hand in hand. Okay, so uh, if you've got Raspberry, and this library will actually be pre-installed for you. Uh, so I'm going to import that library, and then the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set the mode. So do you remember I told you the Pi has 40 pins? Okay, now it starts, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. But you can also reference these pins by the GPIO pin. Remember that I showed you that all those numbers were all over the show. So GPIO pin 4 is actually the sixth pin. 17, GPIO pin 17 is actually the 11th pin. You know, it's just, it's, it's a mess. I, I'm not exactly sure who thought that through. Uh, or probably no one, but what we're telling it is that I want to use BCM, which means I want to refer to it by the pin, you know, the GPIO pin uh, number, not by the ordinal pin. And then I'm going to tell it which pin I'm going to use. So I'm going to use GPIO pin 17, which, as I said, is the 11th one down, which is the sixth one down the left-hand column. You get very good at remembering that. I've actually got a little, there's a lovely little uh, breakout board that you can get uh, that actually has all of the pin numbers. Uh, when you put it into the breadboard, it make, makes your life a lot easier. Okay, then we're going to go and set it up. We're going to tell it which, uh, 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 you know, which GPO pin we, we want to use. And most importantly, we're going to determine the direction. So remember, we want to turn this pin on. I don't want to read the value at that pin. I want to turn that on. Okay, so that's, that's simply saying apply a 3.3 current to that pin. And remember, that is now connected to my relay on the control pin. So what is that going to do? It's going to flip the solenoid. It's going to turn on my plug, okay? And then that's going to turn the water on, right? Okay, so that's what that does. Now, that actually doesn't do what that does. That does what that does, right? Okay, so then we can actually go and flip the thing to open or close, right? So high one, 
low zero, right? So then I can flip that value back and forth, okay? So if you go through the little training videos, you know, because everybody goes to YouTube or whatever, you know, they always, they always like taking, you write it in a little infinite loop and you say, turn it on, a little LED, you know, sleep for two seconds and then, and then you get the little disco lights going. And they, you feel proud of yourself, right? Okay, so that is operating a relay. The second bit we need to do is read the moisture setting. And it's because of the way that analog to digital converter works, it's actually really easy, right? We're gonna do pretty much exactly the same thing. So code kind of looks the same. Big differences is, this time I'm going to read the setting. I wanna know what the value of that pin setting is. So it can either be one or zero, depending on how I twisted that little uh, item, okay? And then I'm going to read that value with this GPIO input value. So it's gonna read the value at that, at that port. And then I'm just saying, you know, if it's zero, oops, so, if it's zero, you know, say it's moist, and if it's uh, uh, one, say it's dry. I found them to be inverted. I, I would have gone with the other way. Maybe I just messed up my code. As I said, I'm not a good developer. So, uh, but that, that's what worked for me. And this allowed me to then go and, you know, I was then gonna say, if this thing is moist, then do that, right? If then else kind of stuff. So al almost AI-like if you uh, buy into that. Uh, okay. <laughs> So the next thing was predicting rain, and I said predicting rain because I'm not doing the predictions. I'm very simply just reading off a web service. Uh, so very quickly, this is not a Python tutorial, but a couple of two pieces that are really important. It's the parameterization of the string, because even I know you shouldn't put your API keys in the code itself. Um, so, 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 so basically, you want to parameterize that and then call that web request, and then up comes the JSON body. We're going to use the... Uh, 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 sort of JSON sort of libraries to go and pass through that item. And remember I said that I get, I'm, I'm gonna go and read through the first 24 items, uh, and then it has this ugly way, I'm sure there's a more elegant way of doing it, but it works, it works. That's, don't mock code that works, right? Uh, so yeah, so basically it's gonna go and read that value in, and uh, you know, if, if that value, I'm gonna set it by default to false, if it finds a value where it contains the word rain, it's gonna set it to true, and then that's gonna be the trigger. Simple enough, nothing fancy there. Questions on any of that? Okay. I'll take a sip of water here, it's exhausting. Okay, so, uh, so we put it all together, basically uh, uh, sort of plugging little bits of wire. I have my little device over here kind of looks like that for, for those of you who are there. I didn't say it was pretty. Okay, so, like I told you, a considerable amount of space got wasted on power conversion, okay? Uh, there's obviously two real ways I can solve this. Uh, the one is not having that 12, that 12 volt stepper, so a little stepper, step up transformer would have definitely saved me a bit of effort there. Uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily need a four channel. I can use a one, oh, this side, all right. And, uh, and yeah, so, 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 so this is what I built. And DevConf was in Cape Town two days ago. So I put this in my bag and went through airport security. Okay, so <laughs> I told the guy there's something different in there, but he, 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 he told, stir, please step back. He looked through my bag, said, no, he's gonna have to call his supervisor. Call the supervisor. I have a flight in 20 minutes. Supervisor took 15 minutes to get there. He's, he's looking at this thing, he asked me to describe what it is, he asked me where's the batteries. Because obviously in their training, they know the detonator is usually hidden in the batteries. I like, it doesn't have any batteries, it has a plug. <laughs> but he knows I have batteries in my mouse, my toothbrush, my, so he took them all, right? So <laughs> I arrived in Cape Town with no batteries. But uh, anyway, that, it was all good fun. But this is the device, and basically what I did is I wanted to, you know, I wanted to basically have this separate, because the first time I built this thing, I actually tried to put this, uh, uh, the solenoid inside of the box because water and electricity do not mix. Okay, and I just couldn't get a good seal. So eventually I decided to just put that on the end of a big lead. I, I, I've sort of sealed that up so no water can get in there. And it works quite nicely. It's not pretty, as I said, but it worked and I was I'm somewhat proud of it. For project one, yay. Okay. Uh, the power I'm not entirely happy with. I also, uh, somebody said I should try a little solar, get a little solar set up. It costs like a thousand bucks just to get a little solar uh, whatnot. And it's like, well, that cost me about 10 bucks to do. 
you know, some, you know, sometimes you have to be practical. But let's just have a look at those costs, okay? Now, I could go buy that little dangle thing that uh, I showed you that my house has for about like five, you know, 4 dollars or something, right? They're really not expensive. But how much did I spend? Okay, so the, uh, the solenoid cost about uh, 155 bucks. The Raspberry Pi, I'm using a good Raspberry Pi. You should not have your best Raspberry Pi in the garden. Okay, so there's actually a far nice one, and I'll show you. Uh, little uh, Pi Zeros. I do have them, and I use them in some of my other projects. That was the appropriate one. It's just not what I did at the time. Okay, and those, those go for about 500 bucks, right? But straight up more. Okay, uh, I've got a little DHT sensor, which I didn't talk about, but that actually measures air, humidity, and temperature. Okay, uh, I've got the soil hydrometer, which is that little, that little uh, forky thing. Uh, it's got that little... So there. I mean, would you want me to pass this around and you guys can break it? I'm happy to do that. Uh, so, I see everything's come loose as well. But yeah, that's a little uh, soil hydrometer. One of the problems with these things is you actually go through them because what does electricity plus metal plus water equal? Rust, right? So, 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 so these are essentially, they're not too expensive, but, uh, but you expect to go through a lot of them, right? Okay, so yeah, that was basically my setup. Cost one full. Now, as MasterCard liked to say, all right, so it was the learning that was worth it, okay? So I now know how to use my Pi, and I'm a step up ahead of most of you because I've actually used a Pi for what it's worth, not <laughs> as a media player. Okay, so like I said, uh, that was my first, that was my gateway drug, okay? So the next thing I built was my little aquaponics setup. Okay, now, anybody here know what aquaponics is? Growing plants with fish, right? So hydroponics is growing plants in water. Aquaponics is, is getting fish and plants together. So this is kind of the setup. And, and the idea behind it is fish poop, okay? You've seen your tank turn green, right? And this is because of the poop, okay? So poop comes out, turns into ammonia. There's little bacteria that convert that into nitrites, nitri nitrites, and, and that's perfect plant food and generally just turns into algae. Okay, my tank gets really dirty really quickly. So that was, I kind of wanted something to absorb, again, lazy. It wasn't because I, I just wanted to not clean that tank as much. All right, so um, what did I end up building? Well, at first I actually, and this was, uh, this is the most expensive talk I've ever done, and this is because of this little oopsie. I went and, I went and built a timber frame. I, I know how to work with wood, right? I don't necessarily know how to work with other things. Uh, Apparently, I don't know how to work with wood either, but I built this little wood frame and this little wooden trough, and I got this pond liner, the special, because you know, I don't want it to kill the fish, I don't want it to be toxic, because you know, I'll be eating it, my kids will be eating it, right? So I wanted something that's sort of uh, inert. Stuff costs an absolute fortune, 1,000 bucks, just, just for that pond liner. All right, so uh, uh, yeah, and I ran it, and I, and I had my little bell siphon running, and I'll tell you what the bell siphon is in a second, and it was working cool, and I took it out and I let it dry in the sun for, it must have been 20 minutes. I came back and all the wood had split in the things and all of my, I, I must have put 40, 50 hours into this thing and it broke in seconds, right? So in a flat panic, all right, I ran off to the plastic store and I got those and I got that assembled for about 300 bucks in half an hour. Okay, so <laughs> important lesson. Go cheap, right? <laughs> you know, things will go wrong. Do not invest a lot of money into it. So anyway, so this is my little hydroponic setup. As you can see, I've got a little trough at the top. It's got little plants. That is my bell siphon. Okay, and what a bell siphon does is basically uh, uh, when the water sort of level starts, climbing, when, when, when it gets to a certain point, it actually forms a siphon and it just sucks all the water out. And I, I found this. Because when I started building this thing, what I wanted to do was have a pump that would pump water up there. Then I was going to have a little sensor that would determine when it was full. And when that happened, I would then f turn that motor off and then turn another motor on that would drain the thing. Now, what would have happened if that sensor failed? Mike's kitchen was flooded. Okay, it happened once. It did happen once, but not because of the... Uh, but, but, but yeah, so physics is better than your electronics, at least better than my electronics. So I found this, and it's, it's been reliable. It's actually really cool. What it's got is it basically takes five minutes to fill up, takes one minute to drain, right? So I've, I use what, this is called an ebb and flow, not a NFT or nutrient flow technology. I'm not sure what the T stands for. That you usually see with hydroponic systems where they trickle water past the roots the whole time. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so, so uh, 
I used a little relay. That's, that's to control the lights. When this photo was taken, you can see I actually still had a plug there, but the relay is there now, okay? It's actually what's called a shield, so it's actually built right into the Pi itself. It's like something that flips right on top, so you don't have this, this separate thing, okay? I've got the DHT11 sensor. It tells me how humid it is. It's, it's, that's been interesting because this room is my laundromat, and the tumble dryer, actually, you know, the humidity just spikes and then, and, and then you see that, so, so that's pretty cool. I've also got a uh, immersible uh, temperature sensor, which is a little thermometer at the end of a rubber tube. It's kind of been useless, to be honest, because I've got, you know, my fish tank ha has a regulated temperature, the thermostat, so it's like always 24, right? So it actually hasn't been a very useful uh, uh, thing. And then I've got a pie cam, right? So if you look at there, you can see a, there's a little camera at the top there, because I was gonna go and take photos every sort of hour so that I could see these plants grow. Now, honestly, it didn't work that well. One was the perspective, right? And something happened, okay. So this is a close-up. You can see that bell siphon. As I said, there's that, that inner tube. That's when the water gets to that level. The water sort of goes down and it creates a vacuum and it just sucks the water dry. It's actually really cool. Um, I started off with two types of plants, lettuce and spinach. You can see that the spinach did not grow at all. Whether that's just the seeds or the fact that uh, lettuce doesn't actually like growing, uh, in, or, or spinach doesn't like growing in that environment. So uh, uh, this is something that we call rock wool. It's like, it's like candy floss almost, right, in texture, but it's, uh, uh, they take a type of rock and they spin it, almost like candy floss, right? Um, so, uh, but it's, it's always very dense. Uh, I've always read, and I, I don't think that's working well for me. So I've actually now gone in little lava tube, uh, little beads, little clay pellets, uh, and I'm running other things through there. But my lettuce was growing quite nicely, as, as you can see, and then it stopped growing nicely, and it was always flat. And I couldn't figure out why it was always flat. But if you look at this, think about the nice warm lights on top and the fish underneath. What likes light, warm light, and fish? Uh. My cat, okay. <laughs> So my cat has no respect for my lettuce, and, and it kept trampling on it. But you can see, <laughs> she's actually, she does have respect for the basil and the fennel and stuff, right? But had no respect for the lettuce. So uh, I do need to figure out how to do, and that maybe the camera becomes, I could actually get some AI, you know, with the cat, and then get us a water sprinkle or something, right? <laughs> but anyway, so that was a good lesson. But uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, I quite enjoyed this project. It, it was definitely the most... Fun, I think, right? Uh, definitely the most work. Uh, so the most heart-stopping when I think I didn't have a project. Uh, and then uh, the final one is the mushroom box, right? So uh, I don't know if many of you know, mushrooms are kind of like, they're actually closer to people or animals than they are to, uh, to plants, right? So there's a couple of peculiarities. One is they like human environments, all right? So one of the simple solution is just to put them in a little tote, a little uh, plastic uh, tub. The problem is that they actually exhale carbon dioxide, and they don't like that carbon dioxide, right? Like us, if you put us in, in this little room for too long, we would eventually die. So, how, so how, how do we solve this problem? This is kind of how I did it. Not pretty again, but uh, uh, essentially this. I've got my little ras Raspberry Pi Zero. As you can see, it's a lot smaller, okay? Uh, I have a, another little camera, okay? I have a, DH, uh, a DHT11 sensor, so I can read the uh, humidity and temperature. So when it gets to a certain humidity, I can take an action. Anybody want to guess what that action is? I've got a little fan over there, a little 5-watt one, which means it can run through that power. It's not very powerful, but it doesn't actually need to be. I just run it through an air filter. Uh, mushrooms are very susceptible to infection. So it, it, it's basically using the... Um, the filter media for fish tanks, okay, so, so uh, I've got the, uh, the stuff there, but I've also got a whole bunch of holes, uh, so it can actually pull in air, uh, and you get that nice uh, uh, air cycle. So I've got a little five volt van, I've got the DHT and the Pi cam, and uh, obviously exactly like I was planning to do with the uh, hydroponics, I used the uh, Pi cam for a time lapse, and this one actually did work nicely. I had a problem with Prestic at one point, because I, I use Prestic, right? I'm, I am cheap, and you will see the camera kind of tilt just a little bit, and then I put it back. Uh, but I did forget to put the lid on, but uh, I thought it was actually really cool, right? So if you look at them, you can actually see the mushrooms growing. Uh, and you can see the day. And then, oh, there we go. That was the, I tried to edit it out a little bit. 
You can see the mushrooms growing. Grow, grow, grow. So one of the things, I, I actually left it on my counter. Mushrooms don't like a lot of sunlight, right? But I wanted the, I wanted the footage more than I wanted the mushrooms at this point. <laughs> okay? So uh, you will see that they actually mature very quickly when they start developing those little fins. They're, they're actually, a, it, it's a little bit too far. But yeah, that was, uh, that was my mushroom uh, growing experiment, right? So uh, I thought that actually worked. I know this is my greatest output. I, I think that's actually really cool. Uh, so yeah, so that was my, my mushrooms, my things. So thank you for that. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. Uh, as I said, I, I didn't expect to teach you anything useful, but maybe motivate you to uh, go home and actually use those pies for what they're worth. And if you have any questions, I am more than happy to take them. This thing's flapping around. <laughs> oh. So it's a tough one. Do you get questions answered, or are you first in line for drinks? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any questions? No, you mentioned the, the soil. Uh, uh, yes, the soil moisture probe, yeah. That, that how do you, how do you pick that up? Huh? That? At the moment, I don't. But I can build another device that checks that one. Um, <laughs> so one of the, and I'll be honest with you, it's, it's actually another problem in my system is I'm only checking one pot. Really what I should probably do is have an array of these things. You know, so if you had 10, you would know when one went out. Um, but then I would have the problem is now how do I control each 10, you know, the yak problem, right? So, uh, but yes, um, they last about three months, right? So it, it hasn't really been a problem yet, but uh, it can be a problem. So I have the same problem with uh, moisture sensors, and uh, I decided to just power it on when I'm taking the reading and then power it off. That yes. way you extend the life cycle. So what you can do is you can actually, so I only turn mine on when I'm taking the reading and then off. So, or you can leave it continuously running. The problem is when you continuously leave it running, you know, that's when the electricity and the rust. So you want to try and run this thing as little as possible. Um, but yeah, uh, yes, you want to limit the amount. Yes? That was three days, right? Uh, now they, they grew too quickly, as I said. You, you wouldn't usually you'd put them in a, uh, a darker sort of environment. Uh, and then, 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 but yeah, generally a week and they're good to go, right? So I've got like three or four little totes with a continuous sort of supply and a couple of different breeds. So that was what we call an oyster mushroom. Those, those were gray oysters, uh, but you can get a, a whole bunch of different types of mushrooms. Sorry. I see you're a fun guy. Um, <laughs> 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 so have you considered yourself to walk the walk? Huh? I, I tell you. So what's been fun is, especially when I was putting the aquaponics system together, you're going and firing all the hydro shops, and hydro really is just code word for, you know, grow your own weed store. So I've seen a lot of interesting contraptions for growing weed. Uh, we're not like, in, you know, when you read all these guides and stuff, you know, these Americans, they just pop to the store and they just get this. You know, we just can't do that. We don't have... So I had to go to these weird stores, and I really couldn't find all the pieces I need, which is why I had to hack... Yeah. That's why there's so much plastic, right? I also, maybe that's where a 3D printer would really start coming into things, but again, the hamster, you know, uh, shaving the yak thing is like, how do I use a 3D printer? All right. Have you thought about doing a little bit more sort of expansion on it and turning it into a bit of a home automation setup? Um, well, yeah, look, I mean, that's, as I said in the beginning, this is not an IoT kind of talk. There is, I actually do on the, on the uh, um, aquaponics setup, I actually do write those little JSON packages into a blob store, and one day I will do something with that, but I haven't done anything with that yet. Um, but yes, eventually that would be... I actually was, because I, I went to a conference in London, and I was trying to figure out how do I then enable remote access to my Pi, to, but it was actually just easier, you know, just, just to ask the wife to turn it on and off every day, just in case. <laughs> um, so yeah. Okay. Is that it? All right, guys, then I... Oh, one more. Huh? In that particular instance, no. But yeah, they are generally quite nice. Fry them up with a little bit of butter. Uh, they're, they're quite delicious. I'm not a huge fan of oyster mushrooms. It's probably one of my lesser favorites, but I think they're the prettiest in terms of effect, right? Uh, you see that whole... And, but when they go all whittly like that, then they're actually not uh, that nice. But then you get those special mushrooms that... Uh, 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 but, uh, but you're not allowed to grow that. You are actually, interestingly enough, you are actually allowed to buy the spore, right? 
Because the way the legal framework says, selling the spores are not illegal because those are not psychedelic mushrooms. It's only when you actually grow them in the media and those things germinate or, 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 or sort of come around, that's when you have a, something that you're not meant to. So you can actually go and buy the spores quite openly on the internet. Uh, and yeah. It's weird, huh? It is weird. All right. Okay, guys, thanks a lot, eh? All right. Woohoo! We're dead!